Okay. No, you've got about two minutes. April 5th. Okay, I see Paris. It is seven o'clock and we will call this meeting to order. Roll call will show that five board members or four board members are present and Miss Salem is excused this evening. She's not going to be able to join us. Um, and I think we've got our two student representatives joining us uh, remotely, virtually. Yes. Um, at this time, I invite you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America. America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Ms. Midzik, is there a communication you'd like to share with us? Yes, there is. Uh, students and staff have returned to school today following the spring break, and tonight we'd like to welcome Mrs. Derrick and Mrs. Bauer from Canterbury Elementary, who will present the Panther Pride Report. Tonight is the last meeting for school board member Kim Salem, who is excused, but I'd like to thank her for her service to the district. I appreciate her insight and support during her time on the board. The general spring election is tomorrow, April 6th. There are four candidates running for the school board, and the public will vote for two. Results of, will be the official after the canvas to verify the vote is held on the Monday of April 12th. 
A school board candidate has claimed on their printed campaign material that they were endorsed by the Greendale School District. The district does not, has not, cannot, and will not endorse candidates for the school board. The candidate was endorsed by another group and has issued a correction on their campaign Facebook page. At this time, 290 of our 370 staff members have received vaccination from the Greendale Health Department and others have sought vaccination elsewhere. Beginning today, April 5th, all people aged 16 and older in the state of Wisconsin are eligible to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. The district is working with the Greendale Health Department on the possibility of hosting a vaccine clinic for 10th through 12th grade students at school outside of the school day. A letter outlining the opportunity and asking for parent guardian interest will be sent home tomorrow to families. The Park and Rec Department and volunteers held a bunny hop tour with a goodie bag of items donated by village businesses. That was a lot of fun. Uh, the alternate fall sports season is now underway. Varsity football is 2-0 and boys soccer is 1-0 and both are currently undefeated. Cheer, palms, and marching band are back in action as they perform at the football games. The traditional spring season will begin April 19th. These sports include track and field, softball, golf, baseball, girls soccer, and boys tennis. Next week, we will celebrate homecoming. The Greendale High School Student Council has created a variety of safe and fun activities to celebrate homecoming, including a drive-in movie, a powder puff game, and a football game. And instead of the traditional homecoming dance, Students are invited to a food truck frenzy in the back parking lot on Saturday, April 17th. Before spring break, Connect Media Communications students worked in groups on a marketing campaign in which they picked a product or a business, researched costs, yearly sales, benefit and characteristics, competitors, etc., and then came up with a theme, slogan, and subsequent advertising ideas. Students pitched their marketing campaign to the class who voted on which slogan and advertisement they liked best. After this, all groups will create an advertisement and a commercial. The middle school's team Inspire 8th graders became empathy advisors in the month of March. Working in teams, they investigated issues like discrimination, inequality, stereotypes, and racism. Students learned how to be informed and take action to make our world more inclusive and welcoming to all. 5th grade students at Highland View Elementary participated in group debates in March, discussing their research-based argument topics. It was a cross-curricular unit where students researched their topics during reading and applied their research during writing. First graders at College Park practiced many reading and language arts skills during partner times before spring break, and the second graders at Canterbury have been studying American symbols in March by researching information from books on epic and videos. They are using the information they learned about one of the symbols to write an opinion piece on why the symbol should represent the United States. Students will share their presentations with an audience that will vote on which symbol they think should best represent the United States. The next school board meeting will be held on Monday, April 26th, at which time new board members will participate and take their official oath of office. Our typical second meeting of the month is on the third Monday, and this one is on the fourth Monday. That concludes my communications. All right, thank you, Ms. Bidzik. Continuing on the, with the agenda, we, uh, as Kim mentioned, we have Mrs. Derrick and Ms. Boward here to talk a little bit about what's happening at Canterbury Elementary School. So welcome. Thank you. I I push the button? There you go. Sorry, it's the first time presenting in person in a very long time. It's awesome to be here. I realized earlier when you announced us, I smiled, and I was like, well, you're not going to be able to see that behind the mask. So we did smile that we were both here. Um, I'm here tonight with fourth grade teacher Amy Bauer to present on workplaces and Amy's going to take most of this presentation because she is um, doing the work directly with students. But this work began out of some PLC work, our professional learning communities that we started last year at Canterbury. And we were working within, um, at the fourth grade level specifically, we were looking at math. And the fourth grade team had done a lot of work before I started at Canterbury looking at math standards, where they fit in the curriculum, and how they relate to our report card indicators. So really getting a handle on the standards that are being taught, where they're being taught, and how um, to best relay that information to students and parents. So this work, um, now moving into workplaces, was born out of that PLC work. So. Um, as she said, we did a lot of work on the standards and the curriculum, but one of the pieces that come along with many parts of Bridges was workplaces. 
So just a little bit of background of workplaces. It's a fancy name for math games. So in this, the games are really to practice math fluency and the math skills that are being taught in the curriculum. The games are based either to work individually, some of them, or they could also work with partners. We practice it as a whole class, and then we can continue practicing that same game throughout the whole year. And it offer, offers a differentiated instruction for both ELL students and also um, to challenge some of our higher level students. So where do we go? So each game and each unit, there is a variety of different games per unit. So this is an example of the games that are in our first unit in fourth grade. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, like seven or eight games. And it um, tells us which module we'll find it in, and then it also will tell us which standards um, are addressed while the students are playing in the games. <clears throat> this is in the teacher manual. So as we get the directions to the game, it also will tell us how we can differentiate for our students. If we see them struggling with something or we see them doing something um, at a higher level, they'll take us to what we can do for the next step. And it also tells us how we can support our ELL learners as they are playing the games. <clears throat> Each workplace comes with a workplace log. And so this is what the students would get at the beginning of the unit. It's a way for them to kind of track what games we have taught them and also what games they have played um, on their own as with a partner or by themselves. So we take and we teach them the game once and then they would cross it off on their mat. Now this was a struggle for me when I first started with this because I didn't know how to use this. I was like, where do I fit this in here? This is another piece of paper for the kids to do. So what we decided as a class was when there was work time and they were sitting there waiting for us to move on, what could they do instead? So we're like, oh, we could play a game. So they would go to their workplace game, Matt, and they would figure out, okay, what game could I partner up with someone and I could play this game and then check it off as we went through the unit. Some of the, we kept these in their folder all year long because sometimes they didn't get a chance to finish them and they could go back and pick some of their favorites from other units, which was completely fine because they were still practicing the skills and they were still practicing the number fluency. So as time went on and as we were working with the PLC group, we were finally figuring out like how can we actually use these to benefit the kids and ourselves and to kind of keep track what have you been working on this whole time <laughs> so that was the logs that went with that I will say that Amy was a huge advocate for that as well during our PLC meetings and that was really nice to have that strong teacher voice to be able to lend that to other staff in the building to then directly impact the students so this is an example of the directions. This is the directions that we have. We kind of summarize it, but we also gave the kids the directions. Um, so if they went back to a game that we paid, played like three units ago and they couldn't exactly remember the directions, we went through and put these together for the kids so that they would have them again. So the directions basically give the materials that they need, how to play the game, and then also the part that we like is the game variations. So that would be if let's say we're kind of getting sick of the game, like how could we change it up a little bit? The kids could kind of read those couple game variations and give them another way to play the game but still practice the same math skill. That one we're investigating a little further. <laughs> <laughs> so this would be an example of the game board. So this one was called Cover Up. So this was practicing their multiplication skills. So they would spin and multiply the two numbers and then their, their goal was to try to figure and fill in that grid. Um, usually most of the games are like take five turns and then you have a winner. Sometimes it's whoever fills the grid first. Um, the game kind of who wins and how they win varies. Sometimes we talk to the kids about could you change up the game? How could you, maybe you got to fill two boards or you have to get the first person to fill half of it. So we talk about some of those game variations in there too. <clears throat> so I asked my kids, I'm like, what do, you, what do you think about these games? So some of the things they said were, we get to have fun and play games with our friends. It's like learning, but it's turned into a fun game. My favorite, it's like learning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> learning math, doing, we're learning math, doing it while playing something fun. It's entertaining. It teaches you different skills using d games like fractions. Math in a fun way. We get to play with partners. We practice the strategies we're doing in class. 
It's fun because we get to practice math. Mm -hmm. um, it helps me learn. Um, instead of something to do instead of computers and student books. And so I asked my fourth graders, I'm like, what were some of like, your favorite games that we've played so far? And so Dragon's Gold is a hit for everybody. <laughs> um, Don't Break Three or Less, a, the game called Splat, Four in a Row, Missing Bingo, and then Decimal or More. <clears throat> so what is this all, what we were trying to get was that it, it's not just learning to play a math game, but it's learning to work in a team. It's learning how to problem solve. It's learning to communicate and talk in math terms. It's learning to respect people's space, have responsibility, and safe. Now, these pictures were taken last year. <laughs> <laughs> not from this year. They're not from this year. <laughs> um, so this was just examples of some of the tools that they would use when they were playing games. So um, we'll get to how we've changed it with COVID and stuff in a minute. So I wanted to show you a kind of a student video of some kids that in my class that are playing a game called um, Dragon's Treasure. So in this video, Chloe and Audrey are playing a game practicing my fifth graders now, because I have a split. They are play playing a game practicing um, using coordinate grids. So in this game, there's three standards that, we will, that they'll um, try to address. So one of them is they had to explain how they would multiply by powers of 10. They had to add, subtract, multiply, and divide decimals to the hundreds. And then they also had to give a point in a plane using an ordered pair. And so that game board that you see um, is what they're going to be playing off of. So this is Chloe and Audrey playing the game Dragon's Treasure. And you can clearly see on this video once I hit play that this was definitely from this year. Correct. <laughs> I got three. I'm going to go up. To the 1825. Okay. And then up again to the times 10. Okay. And then to the side, I guess, because there's a much to them. Okay. So then we got. I got 108. I got 182.50 cents. Yeah. You can keep score. Okay. Okay, um, I got my little red thing. Okay, I got a six. I'm gonna go up to the 1825. Okay. Over to the 750. Okay. Over again to the, over just in between the 750 and the 24. Uh -huh. Then I'm gonna go. Wait, let me see how much that is. One, two, three. That's three. Then up again to the 24, and then down to five, six to the star. So I got the 18, the 750, the 24, and the star. Yeah. Now, one of the things that positive that has came out of COVID <laughs> is that. As the kids now are playing the games on the computer, because Bridges has so kindly now put all of the games digitally for us, so no longer do they have to pull out all the manipulatives that go along with it. We can now play it digitally, and they can also take it home and play it. One of the things that they, we figured out as we were you know, tackling through this year is that the kids have to account for their partner's moves. And so before, they could kind of just visu vis visually watch what they were doing and then kind of see. But now they, it's a real a struggle because we got to keep that distance. So now they have to do what their partner is doing, which keeps them more engaged in the game. They're not sitting back. And then I've heard a couple of kids say, wait a minute, what did you do again? And they, they have a, a greater math conversation going on now from this because they have to pay mo closer attention to what their partner is doing. Um, so when COVID hit, um, we had to kind of reorganize how were we going to still be able to play these games socially distanced with each other and still get them to have some fun in math with these games. So um, this is an example of um, someone wonderful out there <laughs> organized all of these games. Um, they kind of put the screenshot of what the game is, and then they linked through the Bridges site um, the game for itself. So when I tell my kids, like today we played a game called Volume Bingo, I just said, go to your workplace games, 
find unit six, find the game volume bingo, and everybody can bring it up right away. So inside of there, it gives all the tools that they need. So like Sarah's got up, they have the direction sheet. If you press the little button on the side at the bottom. Which one? Then it gives them the game board, and then the kids can play on their computer, but they also can play on, their partner can play on their computer. They have to do the move that their partner's doing, and then keeps them a little bit more engaged in the game. So, you can click out of that. Yep. And so, how were we playing these digitally right now? So, when we were digital, on the left-hand side, you'll see two of my fourth graders and myself, we were playing a game working on um, subtracting from 1,000. And so, we were, we screen castified to each other and we played the game just like we normally would because it's now digital and we can do that. Um, the top picture, um, that's one of my fourth graders that's playing um, when we're in school right now. So I just kind of took a picture of her kind of working with a uh, computer screen of what it would look like on her end. And then my bottom picture is two of my fifth graders. Um, that game wasn't digitally, so I had to pull out the um, dry erase sheets for them, but they each had their own copy, and then they used that divider to keep them socially distanced from each other. So. It's been really important for us to make sure that our students still have access to the workplace games because there are standards in the curriculum that are taught in workplaces and so we needed to make sure that we were giving students the opportunity to learn that content. So it's a real testament to our staff, the Bridges you know, company, things like that, that made all of these tools available for them. It was a little interesting at the beginning of the year. Um, they were, we were really making sure kids were socially distanced from each other, you know, following our protocols and tried to have kids online and do them on their Chromebooks, but have a Google Meet going at the same time. That got a little chaotic, especially with our like second grade students. So it's been really great to be able to have those barriers, have the kids be able to be masked, be um, socially distanced from each other, but still be able to have that interaction. Um, I know our digital students that are online as well that are fully digital are able to take advantage of all of the um, fully digital options out there as well. So we. This kind of started last year with our PLC work and continued on, and then we really, um, you know, testament to Amy and our staff that they really dug into the digital resources and made this available for our students in a productive and positive manner for them for this school year. And that's all we have. <laughs> Thank you. Any comments or questions from the board? So, um, I don't know if I, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, we used to have a program called Everyday Math. Is that right? Um, how does this compare to that? And like, are the assignments? I know that they used to spiral the assignments and so forth. Is that still going on with Bridges, or how does that work? I have not been at school during the Everyday Math phase. I'm going to look to Kim if you could help us out. <laughs> Bridges is phenomenal. I have fully, as a former math teacher, I love it. You know, Kathy, they do. It definitely spirals. It builds upon itself. It really gets kids at a very much a deeper understanding of the fundamentals of math, why they're doing the things they're doing, the processes that they use. It's not just rote memorization, like here's how you multiply two-digit numbers together. It's very much looking at the whole picture and how they are learning those math concepts, which really gives them a solid understanding as they move forward throughout their math career. I can't speak to everyday math from like an administrator standpoint. I'm not sure yeah, of the difference. We replaced Sorry. everyday math uh, with board approval of the Bridges curriculum mm -hmm. in 2016. And one of the things that we highlighted was the increased rigor in bridges. So even if the structures and the systems are similar, the level of rigor, the language, and the uh, depth of understanding in the concepts is heightened in bridges relative to everyday math. And we have seen that reflected in the standardized assessments that have been given from the state over the last four years. And I was just going to make a comment, too, that um, it's, it's nice to see. I mean, you had a few images in there with the students interacting uh, because you, you hear some situations where students are in a very stale environment, uh, you know, since COVID's taken place. So it's nice to see. And, and I think Jonathan had a little bit to do with those uh, apparatuses in between. <laughs> yeah. um, but it, it's really nice to see the kids able to connect with each other again. I, I know last uh, spring was not easy on any of the students or staff. So. Correct. Amy Bauer's room is not stale, <laughs> ever. It is, it is a great place to be. <laughs> Thanks. It's busy. It is busy. <laughs> it's a combined. It's a um, Amy has a multi-age four or five. 
classroom right now. So there's right. definitely a lot going on in there. Are those t are, are the Chromebooks that the students have? Are they touch screen? Is that mm -hmm. what I was yeah. noticing on there? Yes. Okay. I will say like my kids ask to play the games. Like they don't want to be like playing a computer game, you know, like multiplication.com or something. The kids are like, "Can we play so and so? Can we do this today?" Like they ask me to play these games. Nice. And as a professional, I'll be honest, when we started playing workplaces, when we first started this, I was like, oh, a break. They can just play. And it's not like that for me. After we started digging into this, I'm like, oh, they're, I really have to ask these probing questions. I really need to see what they're doing. I really, like my interaction with them has changed so much through this work than just sitting back and kind of just observing what was happening. It's almost like I'm in the game or saying, well, why did you do that strategy? Or where could you go from here? How could you multiply those numbers and pulling in all those things that we're working on in class too? It's fun to, sh first of all, thank you for coming tonight. It's fun to see examples of students taking their learnings and applying it. In this case, it was, they, they applied it to a game, um, but it was fun to see them um, use that as well as have that conversation with their, their cohorts um, to, to explain you know, why they're doing something or what they're doing and to have that conversation um, and really be able to build on that knowledge that's, that's happening in the academic part of the classroom. The language that they're using, kind of going back to your question, Kathy, I was in a second grade classroom right before break and they were lit legitimately solving algebraic equations and they <laughs> were using the term unknowns and they were using correct vocabulary and it, they were literally solving stuff like 25 plus X equals 76. And they were figuring that out and they were using number lines and jumps and things like that and it, it's awesome. And Kim's right, the rigor that is expected but they can do it and it's raising our kids to that level and having those high expectations is phenomenal and they are making fantastic gains and growth um, within this curriculum and within this math program. It's awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. coming and thank you for sharing what's happening. All right, continuing on with the agenda, any comments from visitors this evening? And persons wishing to address the board are asked to state their name and address for the record and limit their comments to one time per meeting and limit their comments to three minutes. So anyone going to share a comment? Good evening. Hi, um, Chris Spirit, 7202 Enfield Avenue and a, also a school board candidate tomorrow's election. Um, March was National Women's History Month. And wanting to know more about where we are regarding gender and education, I read a few studies online, and one from the Journal of Applied Social Psychology was particularly interesting. In this study, elementary age girls were told a story about mathematicians, and then were asked to draw pictures to go along with the stories. The study found that they were more likely to draw a man when told a story about an adult mathematician, but were more likely to draw a female when told a story about a child mathematician. I asked my eight-year-old daughter to do the same, and her drawings bore out the findings of the study. According to the nation's report card, which is an online academic reporting tool provided by the National Assessment of Education Pro Educational Progress, male and female students perform at nearly the same rate in grade four mathematics. This trend holds true through grade 12. Interestingly, though, the National Science Board has reported that the rate of STEM course participation is the same for boys and girls as they enter high school, but for every year they progress towards graduation, that gap widens. Why is that? I believe the study that highlighted the perception of what someone who works in the STEM field looks like is important. We need to keep working to change those perceptions. These are diverse fields, yet many young children believe from an early age that they don't belong and that influences their decision making as they move towards deciding on a career path. It's also been shown that a robust math curriculum taught at an early age can set students up not just for future math success, but can also enhance language and critical thinking skills. It's important to me that children, like my daughter, but also all students, understand that they have a place in any field they choose, that they belong, and they, they can compete, succeed, and thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments this evening? All right, seeing none, we'll continue. Um, next item on the agenda is the approval of the regular board meeting minutes. Any questions? Otherwise, I'm looking for a motion to approve. 
I move approval of the regular meeting minutes of March 15th as outlined in agenda item four. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve the regular meeting minutes of March 15th, 2021. Any further discussion? Can I call for a roll call vote? Yes. 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 And I am yes, motion carries. Next item on the agenda is personnel. So this evening we have three items. One is approval of a teacher appointment, approval of a teacher resignation, and then approval of our agreement with the Greendale Education Association. So anything from administration about? No. The resignation and the appointment are standard. Yes. Just st standard, you know, personnel. And then with the uh, agreement with the Greendale Education Association, uh, the school district has reached a tentative agreement with the GEA for the 2020-2021 school year. So that's the current school year. That's correct. Um, and it incre it inc the agreement consists of a $1,515 increase for staff members who are above the salary schedule with an annual sales with an annual salary of at least $80,340. Um, the GEA has already ratified their, yes, th this agreement, yes. and the total cost of the settlement is about 1.8% of base wages, which equals about $108,474, and that's all been included in this year's current budget. That's correct. Okay. Any other questions or anything else? We, we are eliminating that first step on the salary. This is not uh, addressing the salary structure. This is the negotiations for the twenty the ni the 2021 school year, okay. and it is uh, an increase consistent with the consumer price index. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'm looking for a motion to approve personnel. My motion to approve... Personnel items A, B, and C as outlined in um, agenda item five. I second. There's been a motion and a second to approve personnel, including the teacher appointment, the agreement with the Greendale Education Association, and a teacher resignation request. Any further discussion? Can I call for a roll call vote, Noel? Yes. 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 And I am yes, motion carries. Continuing on, the next item on the agenda is approval of the amendment to the first student contract to add one year. So I believe this was discussed at our previous board meeting where we are part of a consortium to contract with first student for busing services. And this one year extension will get us all on the same schedule with the other schools within the consortium. That's correct. All right, any questions or discussion? I know that we were the last to vote on this. I was just kind of circling back to make sure that everyone else is kind of doing the same thing in this <laughs> consortium since that's part of the reason we're doing it. Yes, so Whit Whitnell and Franklin um, have agreed to this and this will put us on the same uh, cycle as Greenfield who currently has a longer contract. So um, they will all move forward um, with us and then next year we will go out to bid for the 22 23 school year and as that bid process unfolds we will update the board Correct. it's helpful to partner with districts because the volume uh, helps us get the best pricing so that bidding is improved by having a volume of business very good well, I'm off for that so I will make a I'll move to approve agenda item um, six which is to approve the amend amendment to the first student contract uh, to add one year for our busing contract. Is there a second? I second. There's been a motion and a second to approve the amendment to the first student contract to add a year. Any further discussion? I just had a, a quick yep. question. Um, you know, with COVID the way it is, and we have some students virtual right now, will there be, is there going to be any concerns with that next year? Like uh, we have five, five routes right now we're running. We have five routes, yes. And, and so, like, um, I, do, will that have any impact at all? I mean, if we're staying in this, it's probably not going to have an impact, right? There, there's a couple of pieces with that um, in terms of risk. Parents are aware okay. of what their risk is. This year, um, we 
let parents know that if they were choosing to take the bus that we wouldn't be able to guarantee, but we have been able to have that distance uh, because quite a few parents have transported their own children uh, and there's some safety precautions happening on the bus. As we work on what next school year looks like, we will definitely be taking safety precautions. Uh, distancing may not be guaranteed, but parents will have that choice. Okay. So in addition to um, distancing as much as possible, and so uh, um, we've done that within the buses, we also contracted for additional disinfecting services. So first student has hired a third party to be able to do that on a daily basis um, to sanitize. So again, those would be the types of procedures we would continue to discuss on what's appropriate and what can we do to maximize um, safety um, within the, the realities of running those five routes. Okay, thank you. Yep. But there have been no changes to the number of routes that we've made for this year, nor do we anticipate any changes for next year. That's right. correct. Correct. All right, any other discussion? All right, then I think we have a motion and a second, so I'll call for a roll call vote with Noel. Yes. 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 And I am yes, motion carries. Continuing on, agenda item six, so we are, I'm sorry, agenda item seven, this is a review of the compensation model for our teaching staff for the 2021-2022 school year. So this is for next school year, the 21-22 mm -hmm. school year. That's correct. And annual, in 2013, the salary structure was developed in collaboration with our staff. Um, and that structure has held annually. You approve that structure, and upon approval of that structure, that allows us to advance teachers through the salary structure. So there's a known movement through that salary structure. In uh, the spring of 2020, when we approved the salary structure, we decided that we would not advance teachers on that salary structure and froze teachers where they were at on account of the fact that we had an unknown financial situation with the impact of COVID. Uh, middle of the year, uh, which was last month actually, we did a supplemental pay increase to the teachers on the salary structure, and but we did not advance them a step within the salary structure. So as we were looking at what that looked like next year, do we advance teachers one step or two steps? Uh, we took a look at the salary structure and in bringing it forward to you, the structure remains intact, but we're looking to make a market adjustment to the cells within the structure. And that's what you're seeing presented tonight. Uh, this is for information, so you have time to collect and gather information, and we will bring this back on April 26th for approval so that we can uh, inform teachers with their contract what their compensation will be when they're offered a contract for the 21-22 school year. I have a question. We have level A and uh, kind of crossed off because we don't use that. Do we just, can we change A or B to A or are we leaving A in for a reason? The reason to leave it in is that teachers um, on their contract have their level amount. So if we shift all of those, it will create confusion in terms of what level they're at. Okay. Um, so when we hire new teachers in at the start of the salary structure, they come in at level B now and then continue to advance through after B. Okay. We save all the A's for the students. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a placeholder so that we don't disrupt the the system of numbering and sequencing for the teachers who are already advancing. Okay. Yeah, I see in my question from before, I got a little ahead of myself, but um, <laughs> that, that's where that came from. Sorry. <laughs> I, did I, the board I thought that there might be some confusion as to which item we are on, so we are addressing the structure tonight as well. Yep. Thank you. And I think it's important to note that that adjustment um, was also for market-driven reasons. And so to remain competitive with our starting salary, although we negotiate that directly with the teachers, we're hiring them um, by eliminating that bottom step. I believe it was in 2018 that we did that. Um, it allows us to remain competitive with our starting salary. So we did that as a market adjustment, but the structure itself, we haven't made any adjustments to the amounts within the structure since it was approved mm -hmm. in 2013. And, and just as a recollection, I believe that's when Q was added, right? When A was stricken. You are so we, correct. we basically took the bottom out and added a top row. That is correct, yep. Essentially, we adjusted the pay range, you know, in a lot of 
places. It'll be a pay range from this to this, and the midpoint is here. We basically shifted the range up, but because we had defined stops within that range, that's how we adjusted it. And as we look through this piece, I mean, obviously we um, gave a what I'll call partial increase, if you will. We didn't bump teachers this year from one level to the next, but we gave them a, I don't know the term that we use, supplemental increase. Mm -hmm. And so essentially what, by modifying the pay structure as it stands right now, we're in some sense giving them the bump by modifying it, and then we're gonna bump them to the next pay structure the following year like we normally would for our teachers as they move from you know, you know, A to B to B to C and so on and so forth. Yes, that's the recommendation. But, but can we clarify that? So in this current year, 2020-2021, if I am a teacher at level E, I make $50,000. We just approved the, the one-time payout to, for the additional, we split it, the additional $1,515, right? Nope. Not for nope. these teachers. These teachers got 2.5% at the last board meeting. Thank you for that clarification. They got 2.5%. So correct. So if you were at level E coming into the school year, you made 50000 in the 1920 school year. Mm -hmm. In the 2021 school year, you started the year at 50000 but with the supplemental pay increase of 2.5, your compensation for this school year will be $51,250. And then, then for next, next year, year, you would move to level F and rather than getting $750 increase to 52,000 you would get a, a larger increase to 530040 okay. so in essence over a 2 year period your salary increase would be $3,000 in a sense so so it's kind of a catch up in some ways obviously we didn't give um, salary increases at the full amount this year because of everything that was going yeah. on. And so we wanted to be prudent with the funds and making sure that we could support everything that we needed to do. So the last board meeting, we approved the 2.5%. And by changing and modifying the, the structure, that allows it to essentially look like a full bump um, as they move into the next year and they get there uh, as they matriculate through the, the process and the salary structure. That's correct. And to clarify, approximately two-thirds of our teachers are within this structure. One-third of our teachers were what you just approved, the 1.8% increase, because they are past level Q. So they've, their longevity and their, their time in the district, as well as their experience, have moved them past the level Q, and so that 1.8% that you approved was for that group, which is about a third of our teachers. That's confusing because you made two different approvals, so I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you for that yeah. clarification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One, one thing I know we always look at is kind of, um, you know, as we, a large majority of our um, funds are allocated towards salaries and, and benefits, obviously, and that's, um, by design, it's every school district is that way. It's not just Greendale. <laughs> um, and We're a uh, service industry, so it is exactly. <laughs> and, and people it, intensive business. So as we look at the salary structure, I know that that's something that we always kind of contemplate and think through and make sure that we're, you know, cognizant of. I know the next agenda item is taking a look at, you know, some of the potential things that may or may not happen as, as the biennium budget is coming forward. Um, but maybe as a sneak peek into that before we get to that item, you know, how, how do we feel this is going to impact us as we think about budgets in the future and what potentially is coming down the pike? Yeah, is this, by adding 2%, is this sustainable? Because I believe most of these salary increases from, you know, from one level to another it equates to about a 4% increase. There's a couple of steps where a little bit slightly more because we feel maybe at five years or 10 years, I can't remember exactly. Based on the research, it's a retention strategy as a difficult times to retain teachers. So, but, so is this sustainable? So in terms of sustainability, that uh, it'll be somewhat dependent on what state revenues we have coming and going forward, and that's really the next mm -hmm. topic. But in terms of the model itself, the model is designed while you're working through it to average about 4% per year. 
And so this, in essence, slows that down because the staff within the model received 2.5% this year and essentially about 3.5% more next year because they complete that step that would have been 4% plus an additional 2% adjustment to the, the grid itself. So over a two-year period, they would have ordinarily made it 8% under this model, based on what was available, it's 6%. So from a sustainability standpoint, that's more sustainable um, than it would have been had we provided the full four and four for two years. Um, in terms of long-term sustainability, um, that, that's really going to be driven by you know what state revenues we have coming in to offset that we do have increasing salaries. And that'll be you know similar to any district. Um, but certainly, um, we try to be aggressive with the pay compensation that we provide for our staff. And we know that that's reflective of the longevity and the quality of team members that we have within the district. And so we'll continue to work with the board on what we can do um, within the funding available. Um, we identified already that we were projecting a deficit for next year's budget, building in our annual compensation. And what we're providing here does not increase that deficit that fits within the, the estimate that we had for compensation for 21-22. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, this is the preliminary budget piece that we're working through. So, you know, it showcases a deficit at this point, and then we would work towards, obviously, a balanced budget, which we would need to get to. Um, and so it's just a matter of, obviously, prioritizing. And when you think about you know, Greendale having, I think, what, I don't know how many years in a row, number one in the state of Wisconsin for our teachers. Um, I believe I heard, um, if I'm not mistaken, on our strategic planning session that we were number 22 in the nation, uh, which is something, you know, I didn't necessarily know as a school board member that we were 22nd in the nation. Um, and I doubt that many other people know, but that's extremely impressive when you think about, um, obviously, just because you're first in the state doesn't mean you're going to be in the top 50. Because uh, you know you could have one through ten in another state that bypasses <laughs> number one in, the, in a different state, right? So uh, that that speaks pretty loudly about who our teachers um, are and what they're doing. And Kim, going back to what you said, you know, at the end of the day, um, this is you know a service industry, and it's all about the people. It's all about taking care of and working with our students. And so, how do we make sure that we're doing what's right for our teachers? So I'm, I'm happy that you're working towards. You know, obviously supporting that, making sure that we can retain our, our great teachers and um, you know, giving them the, the pat on the back that they deserve for being fantastic. So um, I think this is a good compromise of, hey, we needed to be fiscally you know, conservative on, on making sure we knew what was going on as we're navigating through this pandemic and then trying to make up for some of that as much as possible in this uh, pay structure increase here. So. Anything about, so, so you talked a little bit about uh, level Q and how about a third of our teachers are above level Q. Any thought or concern that we, we should be adding on to the end of the, the salary structure or, or what is the, the thought of that right now? No, uh, similar to any other industry in which you have a salary range, once you hit the top of that range, cost of living increases are part of what's there. So it is consistent. We are not out of alignment with other districts as we look at the top end of the salary ranges within other districts and the incremental increases that happen after that. Um, we, are, we don't think that there's a need to have um, additional increases past that level Q at the rate that they're moving through that salary structure. Um, at that point, we are looking at cost of living increases. And that was part of the initial discussion when we established the range and the salary structure um, with the goal of accelerating teachers as they were continuing to grow and, and develop in the profession that they would get to a fair and sustainable wage. Um, and so the idea was that we would have something that would allow them to get there. And then once they're there, they've reached the top end of the range and would receive those smaller incremental increases. Okay. All right, so as Kim um, introduced the subject, uh, this is for information, but we will be bringing it back at our next board meeting for approval. 
That's correct. So any que any more additional questions or any changes that people are looking for otherwise? And that's consistent with our norms. We are presenting yep. information and giving you up an opportunity to reflect on it before b asking you to make a decision. But uh, everyone's got the information that they would need to make a, a decision at the next board meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, thanks, Julie and Kim and Jonathan. All right, continuing on, the next item on the agenda, and we kind of talked a little bit about it, is the governor's um, K-12 budget proposal and how that impacts our um, budget planning and whether we want to do anything with our public policy priorities. Jonathan, can you pull, sorry, you've got your presentation all set, but can you pull up the public policy priorities uh, from the website or um, the display? Uh, the board has a set of public policy priorities that were approved in 2019 for the 2019-2021 biennium of the state budget. And uh, we were looking to revisit these in uh, the near future so that we could set public policy priorities uh, for the 21-23 biennium. Given the budget proposal from the governor, we wanted to start uh, with a conversation about um, financial uh, and other uh, priorities. So we are not gonna revise these public policy priorities tonight, but we are taking a step to consider some of the feeders of this, and there may be some direction coming from the board tonight in terms of public comment that we may wanna make at the state level as they hold public hearings about the budget proposals for education. And so I wanted us to just revisit what are the public policy priorities that we had two years ago, and um, consider how this might impact what we're thinking. So some of these might remain consistent, some of them might be modified over time, but within the finance area, within the health and wellness area, those are components that may be something that's reflected in the proposed budget at the state level that we may wanna advocate for or um, make other suggestions for to serve our students. So I just wanted to remind you, this is on the website. Uh, for the public, it's also linked in the board packet so that people can take a look at where we were at two years ago and how we might consider this as we're moving forward. So thank you, Jonathan. Um, we have some information from uh, the budget director at the state level around what is in the governor's proposal, and Jonathan and I have taken a look, Jonathan more than me, uh, at how it will impact us, uh, some of the proposals that are within the budget, and um, what that means and which ones are um, important to sustaining our programming for our students. So I'll turn it over to Jonathan. So thinking about the process, the governor comes out and provides a budget proposal and then the joint finance committee um, gets together and has public hearings which will be coming up through the month of April um, in order to get feedback from different stakeholder groups around the state and they're gonna have a hybrid of in-person and virtual meetings to be able to get that input. Um, and from there, they're gonna make some decisions on where priorities lie um, for the upcoming biennium budget. Um, so when we get to July 1 of 2021, we'll be at the end of a two-year budget cycle. So that's the point at which state government has to make decisions about a new two-year budget. So within the governor's biennial budget program, K-12 education is the largest program uh, piece. Here you'll see that's represented in the 22-23 um, second year of the biennium. It's 36.3% um, of total state um, general purpose revenues. Then within the 21-23 K-12 budget summary, here are listed the increases for program areas. So within the general equalization aid, uh, the proposal is for an additional 221.4 million next year, and then 391.4 million over the base in the 22-23 school year. For special education aids, just under 300 million next year and 422 million. And then for per pupil aids, 31 million in the first year and then an additional 29.6 million for the second year of the biennium. 
and mental health aids, 26 million in the first year and 27.5 in the second year of the biennium, and then other categorical aids, 36.5 million in the first year, 71.7 million in the second. So you see from these five categories that it would be $613 million in additional funding for K-12 education, uh, 942 in the second year from that base. So those items alone would be about $1.55 billion over the biennium as an increase. Can you go back for a second, Jonathan? So two of those areas, the special education aids and the mental health aids are areas that you addressed within your public policy priorities in 2019-2021 biennium. Um, around reimbursement for special education, categorical aid, and um, mental health being something that is relevant and important to support financially. So uh, just pointing out that there's some things in this budget that are there, and I think that Jonathan will detail those. And, and Jonathan, as you're talking about these numbers, we're talking uh, just a clarification for everyone else that's see, heard about ESSER funds. This is nothing to do with that. This is mm -hmm. all about biennium budget, so that doesn't take into consideration ESSER 3, which is coming, and some other components as well. Yes, thank you for that clarification. Yes, this would be separate because those would be dollars coming directly from the federal government and being administered via the state versus what the state um, is taxing and providing for in their own budget. And what you're sharing is what the government, or I'm sorry, what the governor has proposed. We haven't seen anything from the legislature yet, and typically that's done later in the spring, early summer. Is that? Typically, we will see that following public hearings that they're going to uh, gain additional insight and information from what they're hearing from constituents all over the state, and then we will hear um, how that may line up with the governor's priorities. So within the, the two-year budget, there's a proposal for pupil um, revenue limit adjustment of $200 next year and $204 in the second year of the biennium, um, given that many school districts are at a revenue limit close to $10,000. That's generally going to put you in that 2% range. For Greendale, it would be slightly below that. Our revenue limit per student is a little bit higher, um, but identifying um, sufficient dollars for ongoing um, index costs. The second item you'll see then is within that proposal also asking for future revenue limit increases to be linked to CPI to provide for predictable and sustainable funding for local school boards. So we will come back to the, the board public policy priorities and that's in alignment with what was previously identified for the last biennium. And in the report that's associated with this, um, there, is some, there are estimates of if that is the final, what that revenue impact would be on the Greendale schools. And just to add to that, so Jonathan, when you've shared with us some budget presentations, you know, it's kind of budgeting 101, that revenue limit increase is really the overall budget. What we can increase our overall budget, some of the state funding that would go to that um, kind of happens underneath. Um, so the, the revenue limits indicates what the overall budget can be, and then the funding from the state indicates how much is going to come from the state and how much would have to come from either local property taxes or alternative revenue sources, which primarily is um, open enrollment for, for Greendale. Correct. So, so yes, um, uh, it would come from property taxes or state revenues, any new revenue limit. The open enrollment revenues are another way for school districts to obtain revenue, and that is all outside of the revenue limit. So any increase here in per pupil um, limit under the revenue limit will be separate from monies that we would take in from open enrollment. But what you will see is that they will typically mirror those amounts when they set the open enrollment rate to say, okay, if we're providing revenue limit for all the students that you have that are residents that are coming in for $200, if you also take in some students for open enrollment, we'll also index that as well. So they are connected, mm -hmm. um, but that open enrollment piece would be the one that's a little bit separate. 
out of curiosity, I mean, how has, a, uh, if you're looking at the CPI, how has that trended with the increases? Has it been way off? Has it been somewhat similar? Uh, Maybe you're going to get to that too, but I was just kind of curious when you're talking about the proposal for it to kind of mimic CPI moving forward. Yes. So we we have seen CPI range from about 1% to 3% when you look at it over time. Um, I do not have any historical averages within the presentation, but a 2% if we're looking at a, an average um, of about $10,000 per student. A 2% average would be close, um, but CPI can vary in that 1% to 3% um, range. Another proposal that exists is allowing districts to choose the higher of their summer and fall revenue membership counts from 2019 or 2020 for revenue limit purposes for the calculations next year and the two years thereafter. Um, this is a significant um, figure because our revenue limit numbers dropped for our fall student count as well as our summer student count in 2020 in relationship to the pandemic. Um, in particular, we saw some of our four-year-old kindergarten numbers drop um, earlier in the year and some of it's recovered later on in the year. And then our summer school, we couldn't provide the, the type of programming, the breadth of programming um, and the in-person nature of it um, that we could in prior years. So our numbers fell um, significantly. We had a drop of 46 student FTE. And so financially, we're talking about something close to $175,000 per year when you average it over a three-year student average. So when you're looking at revenue limit purposes, you never get your last, uh, your most current year. You get an average of your last three years in the revenue limit purposes. So there are, beyond Greendale, there are districts that are significantly more impacted. Um, and we looked at that data in the fall when the third Friday numbers came out. Um, uh, the decrease that we had was smaller than many um, in our area. And so this is an area that districts will be taking a look at is whether that flexibility will exist. The last item is a proposal for four-year-old kindergarten membership. Uh, calculation to begin counting it up to one full-time FTE, which is a full-time equivalency um, beginning in 22-23 for districts, private schools, and independent charter schools that provide full-day 4K programs. Currently, we provide a half-day 4K program, uh, and in the 2019-2020 school year, um, we began research into uh, the benefits and the feasibility of a full-day four-year-old kindergarten program. That was obviously paused uh, with the pandemic, but it is being resumed, and we'll be reporting on our findings and our recommendations in May. This potential change would impact the recommendations coming out of that report. So earlier we talked about the increases to special education aid. So here we see some of the dollars further broken down. So one of the proposals is to increase the state special education reimbursement rate from 28% to 45% in 21-22 and 50% in the 22-23 school year. And to do that at a sum sufficient appropriation, meaning all the dollars that are needed to fulfill it at that percentage level rather than a fixed dollar figure that's an approximate of how much would be um, needed. So what we have seen is a little bit of variance. Um, the, the legislature did improve increases to the special education rate from about 24% to what was estimated to be 30% this year. And given that it was not some sufficient the actual dollar allocation ended up being something closer to 28% when that was um, divvied up. So what is proposed here is another significant increase to the special education um, state reimbursement to get that all the way up to 50% by the end of the biennium. Second is high cost special education aid. 
And so here we're talking about students with an individual program, which is going to be in excess of cost of $30,000. And so here the proposal is increasing state reimbursement from 31% in 2020 21 to 40% next year, and then 60% in the 22 23 school year, um, as well as special education transition grants, um, increasing that 1.5 million in the 22 23 school year. So you see the combination of all of these proposals over the biennium would be an increase of about $720 million. Can you explain what is intended by the special education transition grants? Would you like to talk about that, Mr. Lemke? Absolutely. So the state has developed grant systems where you can apply for grants related to transition services for students with disabilities, and that could be going towards community-based education, um, moving into 18 to 21 type programs, um, situations like that. And that's currently what we're looking at right now at the high school level is the creation of an 18 to 21 transition program. But transition also begins at the age of 14 in the state of Wisconsin. So we're legally obligated to provide transition services for students with disabilities. So there's grant funds available to apply for and get reimbursement for um, providing some of those services. Right, how, thank you. How likely are we to get those grants? Because it's a first come, first serve kind of thing, isn't it? Or it, It's not first come, first serve. They're typically uh, competitive grants that you're applying for. Um, they try to spread grant funds typically throughout the state and allocate certain amount of funds per CESA historically is how that's been handled. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there is a grant process for that. Um, it is a competitive situation and having a good grant writing process helps in that process. There's also other um, ways you can you can get funds on the backside um, from students that graduate out by doing post-secondary outcomes um, and getting some funding back that way from finding out how kids are doing after high school. And that can help um, help us as we develop our grant writing and say, hey, this is what we've done in Greendale. This is the programs we've set up. Here's the results that we're seeing from the programs that we're running. Um, and that can help build a case for why we should receive some of that grant fund. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Tim. So then if we go to the next slide, a couple other areas of focus, mental health and wellness aid. So there's a proposal to increase funding um, there by 46.5 million over the biennium, as well as additional school-based collaboration grants for additional youth services um, uh, like other districts. We've increased our, our spending and focus on both pupil services as well as specifically mental health services. And so the proposal here is reflecting that this is an increase in cost um, for schools. And so this is a proposal to provide some additional funding within that area. Then per pupil categorical aids. So currently six, $616 million um, provided for a per pupil allocation of $742 per student. Um, the governor has recommended increasing that to $750 in both 21, 22, and 22, 23. In addition to that, providing uh, an additional $75 per student for those that are economically disadvantaged. Uh, for, for schools to account for additional support services that are needed. The governor has provided a recommendation to pause private school choice programs to limit costs and property tax increases while decision makers reevaluate how programs affect public schools, taxpayers, and students, and whether any reforms are needed. Um, so he's identified within here that per um, pupil payments would be adjusted by recommended revenue limit and per pupil aid changes over the biennium. Um, and that would provide for an additional 208 per pupil in 21-22 and 204 in the 22-23 school year. So the, the pause that they're talking about is that that's not on existing um, schools, is it? It's just on like new ones or is it on existing? Uh, what's being proposed 
is that there would be no additional students into the private school choice programs um, beyond those that are currently applying for 21-22. So it would essentially freeze um, those additional students in the 22-23 school year. Yeah. And I think it goes back to this is the governor's recommendation. Correct. Because uh, some of these obviously are going to be met by pretty strong opposition in different areas. So. This one is unlikely to. <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. I was like, be adopted by the legislature, and I don't think it's one um, from. Those programs are taxed above the revenue limits, so it's additional tax beyond uh, what you determine in the tax levy, and so from a taxpayer perspective, every voucher is extra dollars added onto their tax bill, um, and so from that perspective depending on what you are hearing from your constituents in the community um, about keeping taxes down and, and the add-on that that might uh, cause, that would be a reason to lobby from in terms of the district being able to run programming um, that is that may not be an area that you want to lobby for. So it, it's really dependent on what you're hearing from your constituents and how that tax is being passed through to the, the residents of Greendale. So uh, the last couple items that we wanted to highlight, um, additional $10 million proposal from the governor for bilingual bicultural aid. So in 22-23, the second year of the biennium, it would provide for $500 per student for those districts that serve more than 20 students through ELL programs. We would be a district that would serve more than 20 students. Um, would provide an additional $1 million to support academic and career planning programming. Um, an additional million dollar mental health training for school districts and independent charter school staff. So we just wanted to bring this back around. What we had talked about at the very beginning, these were two of the, the um, public, um, the school board budget priorities for 2019-2021. These were the two finance public policy priorities was reimbursing at a rate of 60% of costs for special education and ESL services to keep up with need or inflation and develop and implement a predictable funding formula for districts to determine revenue, set budgets, and plan for the future of the district. Um, so the board can provide guidance to administration of whether or not these items still hold true um, and board can decide what um, level of advocacy they would like to seek um, in any of these budget proposals uh, going forward. And beyond the finance ones, did you have the ones under health and wellness? I did I did not have those posted up here, okay. but we could jump to those if we want yeah, to Yeah, so there's four of the health and wellness ones that are also um, considered within the governor's proposal that you would want to decide the level of advocacy. So those two financial ones are important to keep in mind. But um, within the health and wellness, the first four points support early learning and development by allowing districts to count four-year-old kindergarten as a full day of school. That is one of the items specifically within the governor's proposal. Provide financial incentives for partnerships between healthcare providers, communities, and school districts that partner to support hot, um, birth to three, uh, physical, social, and emotional. I'm sorry, that one I would, would thought was the mental health one. Support the creation of systemized approach to the identification and treatment of mental health illnesses across regions. And you see that slightly addressed in here in terms of mental health supports. And then develop sustained funding to maintain mental health personnel, including behavior specialists, counselors, social workers, and psychologists, which is moderately addressed in the government governor's proposal with some funding for mental health training. It's interesting to see a number of our public policy priorities are aligned with his budget proposals. So I think, the f in my mind, the first question is, are, are there any changes that we want to do for those that seem to be already aligned? And then are there things in his budget that we, we haven't considered or maybe want to consider? Is that... Yeah, I think one is um, in the public comment, does the board want to um, direct administration or uh, one of the board members to uh, submit comment on one of the areas that is within our public par policy priorities? Are there areas of the governor's proposal that we want to support or reject? 
um, as a board. So are there things within this that we want to support? Are there other things that you saw within the governor's budget that you want to support um, public comment as a board? I certainly um, support each one of the things that is discussed. I mean, the mental health, the uh, 4K, because it, you know, study after study has shown that starting early education for children really brings them along much faster and, and heightens them. Um, for, for the two financials, obviously, yes. Um, anything additional above and beyond that, I was looking at the aid for um, bilingual, bicultural aid. I'm not sure, would that include additional staffing or does that just say $500 for each student? It hmm. is funding, additional funding for each student, which then we could allocate however that we wanted to, and that could result in additional funding for additional staff, or it could um, be additional funding for translation services, or it could be mm -hmm. additional funding for whatever, but it would need to be, that additional funding would then be allocated to programming for students uh, learning English for the first time. I guess, you know, we've talked about seeing an increase in, in um, ESL students, and I think that would be something to advocate for as well. sonoa has got a couple of things that she supports. Is there discussion from the board in terms of whether that's a board item? Yeah, when I was looking through, I mean, obviously, the one that um, we have the priority around special education and 60%, which I think brings us back to 1970, <laughs> the way it was. <laughs> um, and and I think it also ties into what we're seeing within our district, right? We are a destination district um, because we do such a great job with all students and in particular students with disabilities. And so um, one of the things that, you know, that allows us to do is to obviously shift the, the, the financial burden of that from just local property tax to obviously state support and aid. Um, so to me, I mean, that's one that, that definitely is something that we would, you know, want to support, at least from my perspective. I think we should support. Absolutely. Um, it was obviously a priority we had, and it's coming in line with that closer and closer uh, to what it was. And I think you, know, you mentioned, Jonathan, we were in the 20 percentile, and now we're kind of shifting hopefully up to 50 percentile potentially in that area through over the, the next two years. Um, you know, one maybe this is just me in general but i think across the board with uh everything that's been happening you know lately with different funds that have been mentioned from the federal government and from the state government like you know it gives me pause because i'm just like where is this all coming from obviously it's just insane to see the amounts of monies that are <laughs> being talked about i know biden just put out a plan uh just recently that talked about another massive influx in funds uh including uh what was it Four trillion dollars for supporting preschool or pre, you know, pre-K programming, amongst other things, um, construction grants, other things of that nature, and so it's just like, you know, I, th I, I think there's going to be some conversation and some back and forth. And as much as it would be great to say yes to everything, I think we also need to be kind of pushing on the areas that are most important to us versus just saying, yeah, we'd love it if someone printed more money and figured out how to get it to us. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I love that too, but how do we operate in reality versus just in, in monopoly land uh, of money printing um, and figure out where do we really push into those priorities? Um, so that's, that's kind of my initial gut reaction as I look through this is just thinking through how do we maintain that, um, you know, how do we become and, and continue to be that fiscally conservative district where we're pushing into the things that are priorities, making sure we're asking the right things and not just saying yes to everything because more money is great? Um, because I think that also allows us to lose our voice on what's actually important. So what are the few things that we want to really speak up for and push into because it's going to truly help students and, and help us educate students across the, you know, our community, but also obviously in this case across the state of Wisconsin. Um, you know, we can be our advocates for Greendale, and then we'll let the community voice kind of speak for the rest of the state as well. But that's that's just where I'm coming from on 
Um, you know, this one, the ones that absolutely hit what our priorities were, you know, that why wouldn't we push into that? That was a priority we set as a board. Um, for the other ones, though, I'm a, you know, I'd be a little bit more hesitant to kind of roll up our sleeves and really think through that before we just start saying like, yeah, let's let's advocate for for that as well. Let me clarify something. I, I guess the reason I said kind of let's go for all of it was because these are things that we've been prioritizing for a long time and they're finally coming into a budget where we have aligned with that budget. And so I'm saying if we have the opportunity to push for some of it or all of it, we should at least try. Do we know what, um, what the implications are to tax rates with the governor's proposal? That that information I do not know. There's uh, additional. I've not heard anything about additional taxes. They are discussing a surplus um, versus what was projected um, within the state budget. So some of this is how they're going to allocate that estimated surplus for the next biennium. There was a lot of conversation um, when we received this information, and we had um, heard what the governor's proposal was. Um, there were some questions about how are we looking at this because a year ago we were projecting some significant revenue losses um, and there's a couple factors that are impacting Wisconsin's financial position versus other states. One is that our re the revenue in the state of Wisconsin is distributed across several sources which is tax, um, sales tax, income tax, uh, and property tax. And so when we fund our schools, it's it's well distributed across those. Whereas others might not have the property tax, but they have the sales tax or the travel tax or things of that nature. The second piece is that the industries in Wisconsin, there have been some industries that have been hard hit uh, with the pandemic, and that's the service industries. And um, families who are uh, working in uh, a variety of service industries, restaurants, um, there are certain care industries uh, that are impacted. So Wisconsin has a lower percentage of their workforce there. And those that have been impacted have been hit hard. Uh, but there's other um, industries that have not been hit as hard. And so there's middle to upper income uh, families who have not seen any changes to their income because their business, their industry, has been able to adjust. Financial industries, uh, certain manufacturing industries have been able to sustain. And um, when Wisconsin said that they would tax internet sales, the sales tax that would have gone down if we were tax not taxing internet sales didn't go down. So the the sales tax transferred to an online business rather than an in-person business. And so that sales tax revenue did not drop as they anticipated that it, it would drop. So um, there is a surplus or we have exceeded revenues based on what was projected when the initial discussions were happening about six months ago. Um, and so because of that, they're able to talk about how to spend um, revenues because the tax revenues have not gone down as they anticipated. Yeah, and I, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not opposing the things that we've outlined in our priorities. I'm just saying you know, there's a ton of things inside that area, and I don't think, I think if we start picking everything that's in that, you know, proposed budget and saying, yeah, well, this is great, you know, there's, um, it, our voice gets, gets muddled is basically what I'm getting to. So I think we should focus in on the things that are the most important to us and to our community and to our students and make sure that those are the ones where we're really pushing hard on um, and advocating for. And I think that you have constituents who would like to say, like, if you can do it without collecting more money from us, great, give us some money back. So, <laughs> so maybe to help with that next point, we did provide some financial impacts around these items. So when we talked about revenue limit increase and per pupil um, limit increase, the impact locally for Greendale schools for 21-22 would be 515000 and then the second year of the biennium, about $900,000. The special education reimbursement rate, so going to 45% next year and then 50% the year after, 
That would be an impact of $950,000 next year alone um, and about $1.2 million in 22-23. Um, those are really high numbers, um, but I would point out that we provided in the background document that our local transfer, the additional tax, local tax dollars going to special education has increased over a million dollars in the last six years um, just to keep up with the complexity of, of um, special education programming. So I'm sure Tim would be happy to, to talk further about um, what we're seeing. We're not seeing big drop-offs in um, program services and needs as we plan into next year and think about emerging needs that we have. Um, and so we, without additional funding, we would anticipate in the next six years that will continue to grow. Um, the, the third item, um, allowing districts to choose that higher um, number of um, summer or fall memberships um, and we identified in 21-22 the financial impact of that alone would be over $150,000. Um, the bilingual and bicultural aid, um, so based on the student population we currently serve, that would be about an $80,000 annual impact starting in 22-23. The 4K funding, um, once it would be implemented, that would move us from getting reimbursed about 60% per full-time student to 100%. And so Kim mentioned that that's a half-day program, but with some additional community outreach activities you do, you're able to qualify for up to 60% reimbursement. Um, and that would be whether or not you run a half-day program or a full day, that's still the maximum revenue you can receive. Um, once we would go to a full day, if we were reimbursed at 100%, that would be $4,500 per student um, once it was fully funded. So it's averaged over a three-year period. So you would start receiving um, those dollars in increments. And then funding for students that are economically disadvantaged. Um, so based on our current um, enrollment um, and students that qualify at about 700 students would be $52,500. So that just provides um, some quantities in terms of what the financial impact could be uh, locally here in Greedale. I guess for me, when I look at our public policy priorities and the governor's budget, I, I see you know a handful of areas that are in alignment. So. Um, I, I just added some notes on you know, financial support that's uh, sustainable and um, re repetitive or, or um, the K-4 funding, mental health, and then ESL and um, multicultural support. So then when I look at, you know, th that was part of his budget. When I look at our public policy priorities, you know, under our financial public policy priorities, number one and two talk about reimbursement rates for um, special education and ESL services. Number two talks about a predictable formula. And then under health and welfare, the first three seem to be consistent with what's being advocated in the governor's budget with, with K-4 funding um, and then mental health um, supports. So, you know, as we try to align with what we've already established as some of our priorities are and what's in the governor's proposal, those are the, the, the handful of areas that I see that we would continue to advocate for because there is alignment um, with what we've, what we've um, discussed in the past and with what's being proposed going forward. And I guess that was what I was trying to say earlier. I wasn't trying to say go for everything on the governor's list. I was just trying to say what our, where our priorities aligned, that's what we should advocate for. I don't know if I was clear enough on that. So is there a consensus on the board that those are areas that we would like, that we feel strongly enough about that you would like to make public comment um, in uh, the uh, joint finance public hearings uh, coming up? Yes. Yeah, I think, I mean, 
technically it's always been public comment because it's been posted, but I, yeah, I think you're right on. <laughs> let's put it let's put it out and share that these are the priorities that we've had for the last two years, and we're we're happy to see that they're you know finding their way into the budget. There are uh, four uh, hearings scheduled. Um, one on Friday, April 9th at UW Whitewater. Um, Wednesday, April 21st in Rhinelander. I don't think any of us are going to drive up there. Um, April 22nd in Menominee, and then April 28th virtually. Is there a direction in terms of who you would like to um, submit comment? When you say submit comment, in person or just? We can do either. There's an option to um, submit written comment. I'm, I'm off this Friday. That would be the only okay. time I, I'd be willing to do that on behalf of the board if it's in Whitewater. Um, I don't know if you had any other thoughts of anyone, but if we get a statement of what our priorities are, I would. I mean, you are our legislative what will we talk about legis le le legislative liaison right yes so that might be an opportunity to work with administration to kind of put together those talking points and then share that um, um, at that meeting if, if you're available yeah and it's in whitewater so that's not, not a far drive unless anybody else no, I could not make it but so I, I'm fine with you. My spring break. <laughs> <laughs> Going to white it's all water. for the kids, right? So to be clear, the consensus I'm hearing is to advocate for the special education reimbursement, um, the 4K funding, the, the six points that Jonathan uh, had on the last two slides. Is there consensus around those as the, the areas that we, as a school district, want to support? Yeah, I think so. That hits yep. the mental health, it hits the ESL, it hits K-4, it hits the, C the predictable um, financial structure, and obviously the also special education piece. So, yeah. That'd be good. Okay. So, then, so you have the direction, and you can... We maybe touch base. You can call Jonathan or I anytime, and we'll work it through. Okay the talking points yeah. mm -hmm. we would be happy to help write something up for yeah that. that'd be great you would like some assistance with that yep sure i'd be happy to do that in addition to that so we have our two legislate our, our state representative and our state senator who are not part of that joint finance committee correct we may want to share with them the information just as a courtesy to say you know this is what we're going to be advocating for at or this is what we, depending on the timing, either what we will be doing or what we have done, just so they are aware as well. And I think it's even worth giving them our policies, you know, one pager that we've had for the last two years and right. say, you know, as an alignment with what we've been promoting the last two years, we are supporting boom, 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 and that way well, they can. Yes, I provi I've provided that to Representative Skaronsky and Senator Bradley, but we can update that again I, I, as recently as... February, I think, when I spoke with uh, Senator Bradley, I provided him with those public policy priorities. Right. Yeah, I think that's good. Just it's never. I mean, obviously, they're seeing a lot of different things in a lot of different places. So never bad to kind of point back to <laughs> as we've been talking about <laughs> since we've the last two right. years. Here's what we. So, should I, do you want me to reach out to them then, or? I'd be happy to make that call once you have, um, once we've developed what you want to say on Friday, then I can reach out and let uh, Representative Skaronsky and uh, Senator Bradley know what was submitted for comment from the board. Okay. Okay. Great. All right, thank you. All right, anything else? But uh, I think this was a good conversation, so thank you, Kim and Jonathan, for, for bringing this forward and, and kind of walking us through that. All right, so next item on the agenda is an update on the strategic planning process. Yes, so we uh, have launched the strategic planning process, and I think many of you um, attended the community visioning session, which is now posted on our YouTube channel for anyone to watch. And coming up this week, we will be conducting listening sessions among our community. There are four opportunities intentionally spaced at different times of the day. There's one morning session, one afternoon session, and two evening sessions all held virtually in which uh, community can participate. 
Dr. Schrader will be conducting those. I will join uh, to welcome everyone, and then I will step off so that the community voice can shine through in that conversation, and there's not concerns about uh, power differentials in that space so that everyone can be heard. Uh, Dr. Schrader will then compile what he hears. He's looking at our strengths, our perceived weaknesses, our opportunities, and our challenges, and collecting those and, and consolidating those that he will share with uh, the work team. Uh, the work team will be working uh, two weekends, the last weekend in April and um, the first weekend in June. In the Between the first and the second session, there will be a community survey. So what is produced by that work team uh, in that last weekend in April will come forward with, here's where we're starting, this is what we're considering, and what is the community reaction to those ideas. That work team, uh, we're collecting interest from community members who want to do that work. It does require a 24-hour commitment, 12 hours in the end of April and 12 hours at the beginning of June. And I am looking to make sure that that is a balanced representative group, making sure that we have representation from our clergy, from our businesses, from our parents, from our seniors, uh, and all of our uh, demographic groups that compile the village so that those voices are representative of the diversity in our community in all aspects of our diversity. So um, in terms of board participation in that work team, I would advise against um, loading the work team with uh, board members. You will have a voice at the table because you will have the ultimate say. We will have a discussion at the May board meeting around what was discussed in the first work session and you can provide some input that would then go back to the work team for the second work session. Uh, in June, in addition with the community feedback. But if the board would like to identify one or two representatives to be participating on that work team, that would be great. All of the work team sessions will be um, are posted, so if board members wanted to observe, they could certainly observe, but in terms of participation, I'd recommend limiting the number of board members participating in that. So if you'd like to have a conversation about uh, which board members you would like to put forward to be on the work team who would have availability to <laughs> invest that amount of time and would be represented a representative voice of the board uh, in that work that would be wonderful and so then the goal would be um, that we would present the recommendation to the board at the july 12th meeting uh, so we are looking to schedule the one july board meeting on july 12th um, I, I'd definitely be interested in, in serving in, in one of those roles if I don't know if other people are interested or not but um, one I know I've actually served in the last two uh, strategic planning groups so it'd be nice to kind of see how this continues off of that and then also just with my um, background and you know having been to uh, a lot of schools across the country and, and universities across the country as well um, maybe that's helpful in some of the work that's going on here just to provide some of that perspective that's not just, you know, local perspective. Do we know what the work teams are going to be focusing on? There's yes, so they will be uh, doing some work around mission and vision uh, and beliefs, and they will be examining the listening sessions, the input from the community, and starting to formulate uh, recommendations around priorities for the strategic plan. What are the dates again? Um, April 30th, which is a Friday, and May 1st, which is a Saturday. Um, looking at full day Friday, half day Saturday morning. And then the second weekend is all day Friday, June 4th, and half day Friday, June, or Saturday, June 5th. We did align the April 30th, May 1st date. That is a PD day for our staff, so that in order, if uh, part of the representation in the t in the room will be staff, and that gives us some space that way to bring staff into the conversation. I'm I'm I'm, I'm interested. I would just need to check with my work schedule to see how that would work work itself out, and I can let you know. That would be hard for my work schedule. Um, it would be hard to take off for that. Um, so I, I'm open to the other board members that, you know, I'm appreciative that you guys can do that. And again, to, to echo what Kim said earlier, it, it won't be 
an either or. You know, either you're on the committee or you don't have a voice. You know, right. everything will still be brought back to the board. Um, so um, I appreciate the fact that, you know, Thor and Noel, if yeah. that works with your schedule and you can make it, that would be great. Um, the full board will have an opportunity to discuss it um, at other times throughout the throughout So the with the listening sessions, to clarify, you recommend against us being a part of those? Or? You should not participate in all of them, that's for sure. Okay. But if you'd like to go to one and listen, you can. Uh, you don't necessarily need to participate. But if you want to participate, you could certainly participate. But the goal is for those who don't typically have uh, more than three minutes to speak, <laughs> mm -hmm. that they would have an opportunity to have their ideas heard and incorporated into our planning process. And I, I was just going to say it might be, it would be nice for us to just kind of hear some absolutely. of the cross-section of voices. Right. So if you wanted to, to log in and listen, you could absolutely do so. Okay. Um, and I, I'm going to step out because I don't want people to hold back if they have uh, questions, concerns, weaknesses. I don't want them to feel like they can't say that because they might hurt my feelings. That's a really good point because you you described it as a, a not a power struggle. What was a power differential. A po power differential, <laughs> where, where people you know if they know that Kim's in the room or the board members are in the room, they may not be as open or or direct. And that's part of why we engage with the facilitator who doesn't have um, a personal connection with the work, and so people have a, people feel more comfortable being honest and direct uh, when it's not someone that they're concerned about hurting. So then in that lines, maybe it isn't a good idea for us to be part of the listening? It is it is totally up to you. If you go on without camera or you want to um, engage, you can. Uh, but I am trusting Dr. Schrader to record an accurate representation of the voices from the community in those listening sessions. Okay. That's good to know. That's uh, helpful. All right, um, and so you're sharing with us kind of a, a this is a just second, so you know that yes, this just is the so second you know. time that you shared with us. Uh, we've got Thor and Noel that will represent um, at the end of April and at the beginning of June for those um, work studies, or work sessions, and then, like you said, Kim, you will be bringing back. For discussion at the board meeting in mid July, is that what you, I heard? I will bring uh, I will bring forward a conversation about the first work team and the community survey. What's going out in a May board meeting, and then um, in on July twelfth, we'll bring forward a full proposal for review and it and approval. Okay. Actually, we might bring it forward. We might present it for information and then bring it back for approval after that, so that you have time to digest what was presented, as is typical with our norms. And at that time, Dr. Schrader will... Dr. Schrader is planning to join us on July 12th to present the report with me. One, one um, thought and just having participated in a lot of strategic planning sessions, both kind of at my work or different community groups I'm part of or also at the school district, one of the things that I've seen is obviously strategic plans typically end up around continuous improvement, which is obviously important. You know, here's where we are, here's where we want to go. One thing that I would love to see with this strategic plan is also to kind of have room for something that's true innovation, because I think typically what ends up happening is that in a strategic planning process, that gets eliminated immediately, because it's about here's where we are, and here's how we can grow, you know, incrementally. Here's how we can, uh, you know, kind of evolve as a, as a district. So one, that's one area that I'd love to see us do a little bit differently, you know, not just uh, just focused on the incremental change, but is there something that we could do to kind of build in some more truly innovative practices into the work that we're doing and continue to be the leader, you know, in our, not just our community for the benefit of our students, but also in our region, our state, you know, so on and so forth to really kind of challenge that. So I don't know what that looks like or doesn't look like, but, you know, if there's five priorities that we're going to lean into is is one of those really focused in on innovation or even just a process for innovation to come forward in the district at a, at a different scale than maybe it has in the past? And then the other four are around, you know, more what I'll call important but continuous improvement style of, uh, of growth. So just something to contemplate and think about, but definitely something I'll, you know, personally I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in seeing because I think so often it's easy when you're gathering so much information and input 
you know, you're focusing in on who, you, where you are, and where you, you know, where you're going to go, but you're not thinking about all the other opportunities to kind of grow and, and assess, you know, what that could do for our district. So, yeah, you, you, I think you stated it very well. It's saying that there's things that we can can do that are incremental growth, you know, incremental improvements, but other things that we should be focusing on that are truly transformational. That that maybe we we aren't doing today or we are doing today that we should just stop because you know it'll transform us and let's focus on that i wonder if dr schrader has any ideas on how to to get that i mean you you don't want to dictate what the strategic plan should look like to say you know two <laughs> have to check this box one has to check this <laughs> box and one has to check this box but how do how do we make sure that we're thinking about some of those tr more yeah. More truer. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think in the in the process, you know, of that we're going through, it, it is geared towards that continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to think through, you know, how do we not miss the opportunity for also contemplating true innovation uh, within our district and and being that leader versus a follower and something else that someone has already done. And I don't know what that is, and, and maybe you know that's not a. Uh, Maybe it's not an item. It's not saying this is the innovation that Greendale is going to do, but rather <laughs> do we create, you know, is one of them to create a space or an opportunity for innovation to happen? You know, what, what's the process or protocol that we implement to encourage innovation versus we've identified the innovation, if you will, <laughs> that we're going to implement. We've so, figured it out. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's just hard in, in a listening session um, that feeds into a, you know, work team. You know, you're not necessarily – you know, tapping into the expertise around specific areas that might lean into the innovation. So I, I don't know exactly what that looks like or doesn't, but... Um, I think I'm understanding what you're saying is that how do we ensure that innovation is a piece of this and that the strategic planning team won't develop the innovation, but they should set in motion an innovative, uh, an approach to the innovative ideas that may surface blossom after strategic planning and how do we cultivate that and move it forward. And I will uh, share that with Dr. Schrader to incorporate into the listening session feedback and then um, that since you're identified as a representative on the work team, I'm sure that voice will come into the process. So. All right, very good. All right. Um, since we are seeing no additional comments from visitors. We are adjourned, and then as Kim mentioned earlier, uh, we will be meeting on the fourth Monday of April because of state legislation. Yeah. All right. Remember to